I'm very, very pleased to introduce Seamus Dean to you. He is the Donald and Marilyn Keough Professor of Irish Studies at Notre Dame University, and he was a major, major architect of the Irish Studies program there. Uh, he's a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, he was also a founding director of the Field Day Theater Company. Uh, he's an accomplished poet and has written four books of poetry. And he's also the author of a novel called Reading in the Dark from 1998, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, uh, and which you can actually buy, I think you can buy it right out, right out there on uh, the hallway. And it's been translated into something over 20 languages uh, at this point. And we're, we're eagerly awaiting the sequel. Me too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so he's got an enormous range of uh, scholarly interests and accomplishments, and his scholarly books include uh, A Short History of Irish Literature, uh, which has just been reissued. In fact, I was seeing it, which is still kind of unsurpassed um, as a, exactly what it says, it is a short history um, of Irish literature. He's also written uh, Celtic Revivals, Essays in Modern Literature, The French Revolution and Enlightenment in England, and uh, Strange Country, Modernity and the Nation, that lasts from uh, 1999. He was the general editor for um, a really kind of monumental project, the Field Day Anthology of Irish Writing, and has more recently co-edited with Christoph Zirek a collection of essays called Future Crossings, Literature Between Philosophy and Cultural Studies. Um, he's also the uh, head editor of a new um, annual Irish Studies journal called Field Day Review. And in fact, the first issue was just launched, what, last weekend? Um, and his most recent book, uh, it's called Foreign Affections, is that right, most recent book? Yeah. Okay, most recent book, Foreign Affections, uh, Essays on Edmund Burke, and that appeared uh, last year. And the title of his talk tonight is The Sinking of the Lusitania and Irish Modernity. Uh, so please welcome Seamus Dean. Since I have no mic, I'll be able to wander up and down here. Um, if you can't hear me, you know, you can do something, obviously, like leave or whatever. I'll tell you, this, this, this title is uh, an abbreviated version of one that I threatened to give to the Notre Dame Friday Seminar last year, which included not just the Lusitania, but two other famous ships, or yeah, I guess we'll call them ships, that had Irish connections. One was the Titanic, and the other was Endurance. And one was, of course, crushed by the Antarctic ice, and led to a famous, uh, a famous journey by Shackleton and Tom Crean uh, from Antarctica to what are now part of the Falklands, South Georgia. And I was attracted by that part because it had started on Easter Monday, 1916. The Titanic, of course, is uh, an age-long parable about the rebuke to the modern technological spirit by Mother Nature. But that's a parable that only goes so far. And so I became more interested in the end, in the Lusitania. But what I wanted to call it when I initially described it, I called it the sunken boat. Because I wanted to make a reference to not just the Lusitania, which is that boat which is still, the remains of which still lie 20, 22 miles off Cork uh, in the Irish Channel, as it was then called. But I also wanted to make a reference to the drunken boat, Rambo's great uh, Le Bateau Eve, which is a founding, uh, a founding work of modernity, and also the other boat to which Rambo makes reference within his great, if rather cryptic poem, uh, the boat uh, that uh, Baudelaire spoke of when he talks about the great ship of modernity that is steered by Captain Death, which is always looking for le nouveau, for the new. Uh, and which, of course, is trying to escape from the, uh, the decadent disease, which isn't, isn't essentially French, but became associated with the French, the disease of decadence. So the Lusitania is, in a way, uh, it's, a, it's a, great, a great disaster that nevertheless is associated, has become associated in the strangest ways with the awakening or the arrival, let's say, 
of the spirit of modernity on the shores of, on the western shores of Ireland and on the western shores of Europe. The first time, the first time I actually, I mean, I knew something of it as everybody does, but uh, I didn't know anything significant about it until I was reading Freud's Psychopathology of Everyday Life, where in which one of Freud's uh, patients, I suppose we can still call him that, one of his patients, uh, is explaining, he's an American, and he's explaining to Freud, among other things, about his emotional life, how much he is in love with his wife. And his luxuriousness is such that Freud naturally becomes suspicious. And he says, not only is he in love with his wife, but he's in love with his wife's family, including his wife's sister. And uh, then he tells, faintly, of course, he makes it, he, as Freud is waiting for the error which is made, he finally tells him that uh, he had a dream uh, in which he was on a great ship uh, which was sinking. And the ship was called the Mauritania. And uh, in this ship, he was trying to save his wife from going onto the waves, but failed. I mean, there are more details, but anyway, it's just Freud's interpretation, which is pertinent here. Freud tells him, well, the Mauritania was the sister ship of the Lusitania. And what this dream reveals, actually, is that you wanted to kill your wife, and <laughs> who, was, who was her sister. And uh, that particular interpretation was the object of the scorn of the great Italian intellectual Sebastiano Timpanaro, who died only two years ago, and who wrote a famous or once infamous book in 1979 called The Freudian Slip, in which Timpanaro again says, you know, referring to that, says, Freud talked about that ship, and it is indeed the case when one goes back and checks the psychopathology that ship in which so many Americans were lost. And Tim Bonaro, while refuting this interpretation, again repeats this notion that it was a ship that uh, sinking, which was remarkable and politically important in virtue of the fact that so many American lives were lost in this U-boat attack on a uh, luxury liner on May 5th, 1917. Now, when you go back to, or 1915, May 7th, 1915, when one goes back to look at the actual figures, there were 1,210 people drowned as a consequence of the German torpedoes, and 120 of them were American. So part of my interest was, how is it that the idea that so many Americans died, when in fact the American <coughs> victims of this were vastly in the minority, I mean, in some ways, you know the answer already, because this was, as everybody knows, an incident which almost brought America, the United States, that is, to intervention in the First War. And it certainly contributed to the eventual, uh, the eventual intervention of the Americans in the First War. And we know that at the time, you know, if you look at whether uh, there's a series of propaganda posters published in the most case, for the most part, by the British, about the sinking of the Lusitania and, you know, a great garish poster showing the great liner with an explosion under her hull and saying, you know, the Hun, the barbaric Germans, the barbaric Huns, you know, destroyed so many civilians. This is the, this is the enemy. This is the terrorist enemy that we're up against. Uh, and we know that that exploitation went on for the rest of the, for the rest of the war. And the such posters were used as as conscription posters, especially, especially in Ireland, because the tragedy had taken place, as I said, 22 miles off the southeast coast of Ireland. And we know that a number of people saw it. We know that 10 minutes, 15 minutes before it took place, that uh, Martin Ross, one of the Somerville and Ross team, saw the Lusitania in perfect weather, sliding across the water past Cork Harbour, we know that there was a family called the Hendersons who were having a, a picnic that day on the old head of Kinsale, and they saw the Lusitania steam into sight, and then they saw the torpedo strike, and they were able to time in 20 minutes the ship, after an enormous explosion, the ship disappeared onto the waves. And at the time, no one could understand quite why a torpedo, and as we know from the 
Untersee boat captain, the U-boat captain, that he fired two and that he's pretty sure the first missed, though it was a sitting target. But nobody has satisfactorily uh, you know, explained why a ship of that size should have exploded with such force and sunk with such speed. After one strike from a torpedo, it didn't even list. It almost toppled into the water. The German explanation, which is probably true, is that the ship was carrying munitions. It was carrying munitions for the war effort, for the British war effort, and the, the Germans had issued an order, a pamphlet actually, leaflet in New York, the night before the Lusitania sailed, that they, had that they would regard any civilian ship carrying munitions as a proper object of attack, because they were being starved out by the blockade, and they knew that munitions for the war effort against Germany were being smuggled from the US to, to Britain at that time. Now, I was sort of, I was sort of still interested, but there was some, something tugging at me here. And then, you know, by coincidence, I, I saw an Irish Times, reported in the Irish Times about, I don't know, it must be like 18 months ago, a report about the owner of the site of the Lusitania, who's a Texan called Gregory Beams, or Bemis. And he had applied for a license to the Irish government to explore the wreck of the Lusitania, and he had announced that he believed that what he would bring up from the wreck was proof that the Lusitania was indeed carrying munitions. The, the Irish government not only surprisingly refused the license, but almost immediately thereafter issued a modification to the National Monuments Act, uh, declaring that the site of the Lusitania was now a national monument. And therefore, of course, meaning that anything that retrieved from that wreck would be the property of the Irish government. Now, even the Irish government isn't too interested in having some rusty old torpedoes <laughs> as part of its naval armament. So I was wondering what this... And then, of course, I remembered, since the, liter the main literary connection with the Lusitania is the drowning of Sir Hugh Lane, uh, the nephew of Lady Gregory, who had gone down on that ship with, it is said, a number of yeah, of course, as you know, he was an art collector, with a number of paintings, one of which may have been a Titian, one of which may have been a Rembrandt, two of which may have been Pizarro's, one of which may have been a Monet. Apparently, the art experts can't agree among themselves on whether or not this is actually possible. But anyway, there were a number of valuable paintings which were carried in lead-like boxes. And it seems that the Irish government had suddenly thought, since... The sudden death of Lane had led to that long battle, that long and squalid battle with the Tate Gallery, between the Tate Gallery and the Municipal Gallery, between the Irish and the, the British governments, over possession of the paintings, since Lane hadn't lived long enough to countersign the codicil to his will, in which he left his collection to, to Ireland, to Dublin. The Irish government had determined, it would seem, among other things, that they weren't going to lose these paintings as well. If Mr. Bemis, the Texan, did recover a Rembrandt or a Titian from the ocean floor in its lead line box uh, that they were going to be able to claim legal possession of. It. So I thought this is this is too much of a coincidence. You know, there's all this there, there's all this stuff about there had always been these rumors. There were two books published in the Lusitania in the last couple of years. One of which was, you know, your classic conspiracy theory book in which it was claimed that Churchill, who was uh, who was an admiralty at that time, had ordered the destroyer, which usually accompanied cruise liners through that most dangerous stretch of water, the Irish Channel, where the U-boats lurked. Uh, that destroyer was within 20 miles of the Lusitania, an hour before the U-boat struck. And Churchill apparently had issued an order from the admiralty to tell that destroyer to turn away in the other direction. And of course, the conspiracy theory says because Churchill wanted the Germans to sink this ship because Churchill wanted the Americans to, to be provoked into intervention in order to save what remained of the British Empire at that point. And, you know, there's some, some possibility in that, but whatever, whatever. It seemed to me that here I was beginning to look at something that was just as much as the sinking of the Titanic was offering itself as a parable, a parable of the modern spirit. And yet I wanted to resist the parable. I thought that the coincidences are, are too many. And then I began to wonder, what, what is it I mean by 
coincidence. Just by coincidence at that time, I was reading a book called Coincidence, and, uh, which was published in London 18 months ago. And in order to illustrate one of the features of what we call coincidence, the author had produced this, this classic story, you know, which you, you may know in many forms. Uh, you'll also find it in UNESCO's The Bald Soprano and various other works. This classic story of coincidence in which, let us say, since we're talking about Ireland, and since coincidence is first cousin to cliché, let's say we're talking about, uh, of all things, two Irish men in a pub. <laughs> and these two Irish men are, are talking vividly one to the other. And one of them is saying to the other, tell me this, he said, where did you go to school? And the other says, St. Columns. He said, St. Columns, so did I. He said, what <coughs> years did you go? 72 to 78. That's amazing. That's where I went, he said. Who taught you music? Was it Willie John Maltz? Willie John Maltz, he's the man. That's astonishing. What part of the city are you from? Rosemont. Rosemont, that's where I was born. That's where I grew up. I know, they're getting more and more excited at all these coincidences. And in the midst of this conversation, another man comes into the pub and orders a drink. And he says to the barman, how are things this evening? The barman said, oh, there. You know, as usual, he said, there's old Mr. McBride sitting over there asleep over his pint. And there, down at the, at the corner there, he said, are the Donnelly twins getting plastered, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, in a sense, you know, has its, own, has, a, has its own logic, which I thought, that's part of the logic of the story that I'm tracing here. This is a story which I know, but there's something else I know about it that I haven't quite connected. I mean, the Lady Gregory, Yeats, Hugh Lane, the paintings, all of that, that's part of Irish modernist history. But then I realized I had read about the Lusitania elsewhere in a book that wasn't published until 1932 in the Irish language, a book by Muris O'Sullivan called Fica Blianic Fas, which means 20 years of growing. It was, pub it was translated into English the following year. And in Fica Blianic Fas, you can, you'll find that one of the chapters opens, but th this is, this is uh, the history, the autobiography, of a young boy growing up in the Blasket Islands off the southwest coast of Kerry. And he tells of this morning when they were at school, and suddenly some of the children rushed to the, the windows of the classroom and began to exclaim excitedly because out the bay outside they could see from those windows was full of timber. And everybody rushed down to the shore. And this massive cargo of timber was washed up on the seashore. It turned out to be the timber from the Lusitania. And then, soon after that, there came other cargo from the Lusitania. But what they were hoping for was the corpse of an American millionaire. Because they thought if they got the corpse of an American millionaire, they might get a payday as a consequence of rescuing them. But the only corpse recorded that ever came ashore in that part, between Dingle and the Blasket Islands, was the corpse of an able-bodied seaman from the east of London, whom Muris O'Sullivan's father climbed down the cliff to retrieve much degraded as it was, you know, no eyes left because of the seagulls and little else left because of the fish. Uh, but he heroically climbed down with great danger to himself and helped haul the body up to the top of the cliff where two Royal Irish Constabulary men who had a handcart allowed him to take the sixpence, which was the one possession in this able-bodied seaman's uh, remains, from a waste pocket. And when they discovered, they discovered his name, and that sixpence was O'Sullivan's reward, and then the corpse was taken off to the mainland. And no, no millionaire was ever retrieved. The other, the genuine American millionaire who died was one of the Vanderbilts. And the other millionaire, or multi-millionaire who survived was a Welshman called Thomas, who was a coal millionaire. In fact, the Welsh papers had, had uh, headlines the next day, terrible tragedy, Thomas rescued. <laughs> <laughs> but the... Um, the point was that somewhere in this, O'Sullivan recognizes that something changed on that particular day for the Blasket Islands. Now, as I said, we could regard it as a parable of modernity. Here comes modernity, armed as usual, at war as usual, and producing this great, uh, this great and unexpected overproduction of wealth. Because so much was washed ashore in the next couple of years 
on the shores of the Blasket Islands. They didn't even recognize some of the produce. They didn't know what to do with some of the produce. But nevertheless, it was, you know, there were good years for the Blaskets. The Blaskets, of course, within 60 years were emptied. And all the Blasket Islanders moved in a group, as they had been doing since the 1880s. They moved to Springfield, Massachusetts, where they very quickly lost their Irish language, which they had up until then exclusively spoken, or almost exclusively spoken. And the, you know, the idea of the Blaskets, as for, which lasted for 10 years, as a great literary center, a great center of literary production in the Irish language, with translations from English, you know, involving from 1929 until about 1940, involving people like Tommaso Creofoin with his great work of 1929, and uh, the Island Man, and then O'Sullivan, and then inevitably, and famously or infamously, depending on your view of it, Peg Sayers, and, so, and a, number of other, a number of other works. And then if you think of, you know, well, why is it that it has been so important in Ireland that some of the great works associated with the revival and associated even with the post-revival period and associated with the idea of being a country, Ireland being a country, which precisely because of its backwardness, so-called, or because of its regressiveness, so-called, why was it so much to the forefront of modernity, of modernism, in its literary forms? Well, you know, think of, think of three great works. Miroslav Sullivan's 20 Years of Growing, people in class. And think of another work associated with islands, sings Playboy of the Western World, the Aran Islands, and all that came out of the Aran Islands. And then think of the other great cinematic work, Robert Flaherty's Man of Iron, Iron which is 1934. And remember the fact that De Valera and the Fianafoyle government is first, first comes into power in 1932. And on the night of the premiere of Flaherty's Man of Iron in Dublin in 1934, De Valera led his whole cabinet to see the opening night as a kind of endorsement of the vision of humankind that O'Flaherty was projecting through that. And of course, Man of Iron is remarkable, unlike the other, these other two works. It's remarkable not for its speech, but for its lack of speech. There's hardly anything on the soundtrack except the sound of the sea and the sound of the wind. And any, any words that do come are in Irish and are deliberately meant to be incomprehensible to the audience. But of course, they're not incomprehensible in a profound sense. We know that this is, you know, this is the basic speech of man versus nature. This is, this is the ideology of the free state, in effect. This is De Valera saying, we may be economically backward, but because we are economically backward in Ireland, more than anywhere else, you can see the lineaments of the basic competition that defines the human race, the competition against the natural forces of wind and weather and ocean, and that the Irish have been able, in a sense, to preserve the language, the language of and the language for, that, that basic collision. And that nowhere else would you find it in this authentic, pure form. And you won't find it even on the mainland of Ireland. You'll find it on the island of the island of Ireland. You know that, that, that division that had been there in Europe since, at least since race theory and was formulated in the 19th century, that purity, very often associated in strange ways with the idea of the Celt you know, the non-Roman, the non-Brit, the non-Frank. The Celt was receding like a tidal wave into the Basque territories, into Brittany, into Wales, Scotland. But most of all, you know, the cream of the wave was still there in Ireland. And then off Ireland, the closer you got to, uh, or the closer you got to the Atlantic Ocean, the more intensive would be the, you know, the Celtic remnant. And the Celtic remnant would not only be distinguished from all the others because of its speech, this strange Irish language, which seemed, despite the greatest efforts of the German philologists in the 19th century, which seemed to be so radically different a language from English, but not just the Irish language, but also a particular mode of life that was associated with the Irish language and that had this degree of tradition, authenticity. You know, you could play, you could put it to, to, to music by now, you know, all of the things that go with the Irish language, all of the things that go with being 
a traditional community. All of the things that go with being a non-traditional community, you know, the loss of organic communal spirit, the loss of that kind of instinct, the loss of that kind of, but very interestingly, not just the loss of language, like for instance, the Irish language, which the Irish indeed have, for the most part, lost, despite the great attempt at the Gaelic revival in 93, but also with that, a strange contrast begins to emerge. Now, I'm, I know I'm talking here about stereotypes that are well known to you, by which many people have been deformed, by which many people have been formed, and which depend entirely on a binary opposition by which most people are born. But nevertheless, it still is part of, the, part of our inheritance. You know, as much as all over Europe, and I think to this day, not just in Europe, but globally, you have a sort of um, a way of stereotyping people which, for instance, says the North versus the South. Isn't this true everywhere? That Northern people are more, what, scientific, cooler, uh, less, uh, more detached one from the other, as opposed to the South, which is always warm and vibrant, and where people gabble much more than they are, much more volatile, much more inclined to obvious sexual behavior than uh, those, those, those weirdos in the North. And such, you know, that, uh, and the North is always more Protestant, and the South is always more Catholic. You know, it's Edinburgh versus Naples or, or whatever. Uh, that, that's, that's standard, a standard binary within the European system for at, at least two centuries, at least two centuries. And it has been highly racialized. And of course, it's part of the Irish way of thinking about itself, North and South. Protestant and Catholic, cold and warm, and all of that. But along with that, along with that, there is this further, further var variation, which becomes begins to become obvious in the um, in O'Sullivan's text, and becomes obvious as we look at the um, the phenomenon of the Lusitania. We begin to see that you know, if we ask two questions, why is it that poverty? You know, not having anything, not having the material goods of this world. Poverty has been in Ireland for a long time associated with eloquence. I mean, Lady Gregory and Yeats made several meals out of this between them. You know, Lady Gregory, when she was producing that, that so-called Kiltartanese in which she tried to write, <laughs> Yeats, when he was talking about the peasantry, whom for the most part he couldn't understand, and had really no interest in understanding, but they had this notion that these people, precisely because they were in tatters, because they were in rags, that these, this bedraggled group, nevertheless, when they opened their mouths, they spoke with this astonishing splendor and with this, this astonishing capacity for you know, syntactical and grammatical complication. Of course, the great play that we have that bears witness to this is play by the Western world, in which the play, in a sense, swivels on the whole axis of the notion that this is an impoverished and an oppressed and an, a dying community, and yet at the same time, this is a community that has achieved a level of eloquence not accessible to those who live in metropolitan or advanced areas. And that this community therefore retains or preserves or is in the, while it may be in the act of losing these, but nevertheless for this moment, it is preserving a kind of traditional ferocity and a view of a view of existence, you know, especially the law and order view view of existence, that has that has gone in Western Europe, but which once used to be part of the possession of Western Europe, indeed, perhaps of Eastern Europe as well. Of course, Eastern Europe had by then been Gothicized into Dracula territory, about which the Irish also wrote with great with great uh, success. Or maybe it even is part of the history of the world. You know, the, the, the idea that a traditional community has a sense of wonder and has a capacity for wonder. You know, how often in, in Singh's work, especially in Playboy of the Western World, do we hear this, this sort of expression, you know, the wonder of it, the wonder of the way in which this man can tell a story, the wonder of the way in which there is a relation or a failure of relation, which is even more interesting, between the way he can talk and the way he acts which is part of the, part of the, the, uh, the notion. It's the old Walter Benjamin uh, 
you know, as, as soon as I say Lescott, where he says, well, what's the difference between a folktale and a novel? And essentially, the difference is that in a novel, everything is problematic, but is subject ultimately to an explanation. You know, when you turn the last page, you find out what happened, or you understand that however complex the social, sexual, political relations might have been there, nevertheless, they are subject in this novel to a degree of analysis which helps you to understand the whole complexity of the situation in which an individual or individuals may find herself or himself and the relation to the larger, larger social pattern. You will need to make a Flaubert or Balzac or, or Stendhal or Dickens or whoever it may be uh, to understand that. But, says Benjamin, if you listen to a folk tale, if you know, even this, this is true even today, if you go to the Yilfach and you listen to a Shanaki telling a story which might be in effect, as we tend to say now, centuries old, but which might only be the age of the Shanaki. It's hard to say now because folk tales are always adapt and adapt and adapt endlessly to the local circumstance. But what you, when, when the story ends, as Benjamin says, let's say it's the story of the, you know, the king of Egypt who is defeated in battle and who nevertheless refuses to be psychologically defeated. So he keeps, he keeps a stern and a steer mean or bearing before his conquerors and then to try and break him they whip into captivity before his eyes everybody belonging to him beginning with his wife and his children and then his household and the king stands unflinchingly there taking this punishment until right at the end of this miserable procession an old retainer who has been with the the house for a generation and a half an old retainer humped with age is whipped into captivity before him. And at that point, at that point, the king breaks down and weeps. Now, says Benjamin, at that point, the novel reader wants to say, why then? But at that point, the folktale audience says, ah, the wonder of it. You know, you don't ask the question then, because this is mere, this is a mystery. This is a wondrous tale, and you stay with that wonder. Now, that element, of course, stays within, within Irish, early Irish modernist literature. But the question I'm trying to ask is, you know, can we say that there is a connection? Or can we understand what is the nature of the connection between being poor and being eloquent? I mean, poverty, after all, isn't the opposite of eloquence. <laughs> the elo opposite of eloquence is dumbness, aphasia. And the Irish certainly had that because they'd lost a language, or almost lost a language, or many of them had lost a language for good. They lost the Irish language, they had acquired or reacquired the English language, and again, to once again quote, as I'm, I endlessly do quote Benjamin on this, you know, when he says, no one has never ever known mastery in anything in which he has not previously known incompetence. And that, of course, could be part of a, a kind of epigraph for the Irish acquisition of English. They didn't just acquire English, they, they became dominant acquirers of it. But at the same time, they became hopelessly dumb and even hostile to the idea of speaking the language that used to be theirs. Because, of course, then we partly see the link because they associated it with poverty, because they associated it with the terrible economic collapse of the famine, because they associated it with a degree of shame. But when we read, you know, in the 1880s, 90s, into the first decades of the 20th century, when we read various accounts of Ireland, and I'm just thinking, I mean, one, one off, off-hand citation would be Joseph Chamberlain, the Birmingham British politician who uh, was a head of the, was a, a leading figure in the Liberal Unionist League, which of course had Irish connections as well as as well as English connections. In a pamphlet, uh, writing a preface to a pamphlet, this is in 1903, four years before Singh's plays produced The Abbey. He talks about the fact that the Irish have, are an unfortunate race in that the Irish, despite the advantages of their island, have never been able to produce wealth, excepting, he says, the Irish of the North of the other faith. But these, the, the native Irish, which of course he means the Catholic Irish, the, they seem to have a natural gift for poverty. 
they can produce poverty the way other people produce wealth. <laughs> and therefore, he says, the best that we can do for them, you know, is as much by some kind of state aid, state interference, ameliorate the position economically for them, knowing that they have some kind of deep down and, you know, inbred incompetence in this area. Now, my question is, what is the relationship? Can you be, and think of the way racial stereotyping works here, and also th try and think of why it changes and when it changes. Is it possible to say that the Irish, being Celts, whatever Celts are, that the Celts have a kind of gift for imagination, a gift for poetry, a gift for song, a gift for this, that, and the other, all of those arts that have nothing to do with political power. And at the same time, accompanying that gift or those gifts, they also have a gift for poverty. Is there a correlation between the idea of being poor as by nature and being imaginative as by nature? Now, we want to say no, but we can say, you know, however, however kinked the relationship may be, nevertheless, you don't have to look very far back in 19th century Irish experience to see, yes, that there is certainly a relationship between poverty and dumbness, loss of language. And if there's a relationship between poverty and dumbness, couldn't one, as Irish Revival shows, intimate that there might be a natural relation, an inevitable given relationship between poverty and eloquence? Now, of course, in some ways, it's, it's obvious that eloquence, even within the racial scheme of things, which belongs to the Celts, and poverty are not quite the, uh, you, know, you know, don't quite um, along in the same sphere, that there's a category error or a category uh, transition taking place here. Uh, that it's not just a matter of saying it's nonsense, it's junk. It's the junk food of racialism, which we all know all too well in Ireland. And which the Irish, by the way, have, have eaten more eagerly than most people and grown even bulimic on it. But it's not just that. It's that there is another, there's another pressure here in the story of the Lusitania. When those, when those uh, young people, those islanders, the Blasket Islanders, went down to the shore to collect all that, those luxury goods as they were, knowing that the luxury goods were also associated with barbaric violence, though they didn't know that much about the barbaric violence, but remember, they were, they were associated, they got the newspaper the next day from the mainland. This was not a mysterious event, you know, this is not something magical that appeared. In. They knew it was the Lusitania. They knew there was a war on. They knew that the, the central battle of the war was between Germany and the United States. And they understood that the United States was delaying its entry to the war because the United States was not going to enter the war in order to endorse the fading European system. It was going to enter the war to replace the fading European system. And if anyone were in any doubt about that, one is only to look at uh, what's his name? Isaiah, Isaiah Bowman's work of 1921 called The New World, in which he avails of the German, the German notions, which were already, remember, this is during the First World War, not the Second War. Those German geographer, historian, intellectuals who are writing on behalf of the German government then, and saying what Germany needed was Lebensraum, living room. And this American intellectual who is brought over to the peace conference by Woodrow Wilson and is later going to be called, there's a recent book on him by Neil Smith called uh, Roosevelt's Geographer. Uh, he says the Americans actually have to learn the lesson of world domination, which is not the European, the failed European experiment of territorial expansion, but of economic expansion. To have economic control without necessarily taking all of the burdens of territorial domination. Now this interests me, I mean it's an obvious prelude to much that has happened in American foreign policy since, but what interests me more at this moment is the fact that when, when the Lusitania sinks, when the Germans make that decision I mean, in, all, in some ways, it's an obviously disastrous decision. Propaganda-wise, 
or you may want to say morally within itself, it is horribly corrupt, that they had decided they are going to take down civilians uh, to stop munitions getting through, but then again they could say war is war, you know, the usual uh, tough guys don't dance uh, attitude towards, towards such things. Uh, we have to take them down, but the, immediately the war between the US and the other Allied powers and Germany was reconstrued, not that it had not been before, but was reconstrued again as a war between the barbarians and the civilized. But of course, one is also to remember that, you know, this, is, this, this, this happens in 1915. The Americans entered the war in 1917, decisively. In 1922, at the Washington Conference, British na naval supremacy, which had lasted for 250 years or thereabouts, is ended. The Americans become the supremos of the ocean and of the air. And, the, uh, and at that moment, I'm suggesting what for Ireland the Lusitania represents is a recognition. And this is why Freud and Timbinaro and the others always remember it as an American disaster, because it was the moment of realization on Europe's part that uh, the, the regime of world domination had passed from their hands, that this indeed is a strategic moment. And this is a, the kind of strategic moment where the world dominating power always accretes to itself the claim that it is the civilized power and that that which it's resisting is the barbaric power. And it's at that moment, I think, and this is why it's so interesting from the local Irish point of view, that you begin to see a massively successful stereotype of the Irish and of the North-South and of the Celt and Saxon, you begin to see that stereotype suddenly move. You begin to see one part of it wear out. It becomes membrane thin. Because you see that suddenly the, the sort of the aegis of the binary belief that the Irish had lived under for, I don't know, 250 years, whatever. Based on the Christian notion that the spiritual is always superior to the material and that those who are involved in the material goods of this world in some ways sell themselves to the devil thereby. And since the Irish could never have been accused of having done that, since they didn't have material goods, or any material goods they had were quickly fleeced from them, then in a way, I mean, if one reads, say, Cardinal Newman, or the French liberal Catholics like Montalembert, or Lamennais, the French liberals who came to, you know, came to O'Connell's Ireland in the years after the um, French Revolution became enraged, and I suppose it's appropriate given the day, the, the, the week that's in it, enraged that the Pope had been a prisoner of the French for so long, the church had been humiliated for so long, yet the revolution had happened and somehow some of the, the secular attractions and the secular advances of the revolution must be kept, but could they be kept along with the spirit of Catholicism? Was it possible to be modern and a Catholic, they were asking? I mean, if you look at Montalembert's famous newspaper, L'Avenir, the future of, which lasted all of one year, 1829-1830, uh, before the, the Vatican began, began to throw its bolts of lightning at it and destroy that French liberal movement. But nevertheless, what they're saying is, if you want an example of a country which is beginning, this is Honor O'Connell, to join the liberal notion of a democratic republic, democracy, as the French Revolution had reinvented it, which, remember, is not only liberty, but also equality. Uh, I mean, there are many arguments that's one of the differences between the American and the French Revolution. But the French Revolution had managed liberty, but could never manage equality, that the American Revolution was the only one that had managed both. And in fact, if it, came to the, if it came to the crunch, was willing to put equality before liberty. But at any rate, in Ireland, with its massive and politically disabled Catholic majority, now O'Connell had invented it, if you like, had created Irish democracy in one generation. But at the same time, of course, O'Connell was desperately opposed to the French Revolution and its atheism 
and Bung Tallenberg and Lamini and Newman all recognized that the Irish actually did have a middle class, but it was a middle class that was a bourgeois different from any European one in that it was still fundamentally, even in a fundamental sense, it was still Catholic. In fact, it was fervently Catholic. And the reason why were the Irish so good at staying Catholic, at staying religious? Because they'd been poor. Because the, it was during, because of persecution, because of the lack of material goods, because they had invested and devoted themselves so much to the spiritual, in the midst of material, material lack, that they had become the most remarkable Catholic community in Europe, closely followed by the Poles closely followed by the Belgians, where the Vatican at that time was in fact founding all its new colleges and saying, we, do, we need people. We need peoples who have democratic impulses and spiritual fervor together. And Newman was the first before Ferdinand Braudel. Uh, Ferdinand Braudel said it, that the American, or the Irish Catholic emigration to the United States in the period before and during the famine was, uh, Rodel says this in his history of civilization, was one of the key migrations in modern history because it showed that there's a Catholic people who could actually adapt to the system of capitalism. There was no necessary, there was no necessary foreignness between the two. That was the beginning of the end of the stereotype where Catholics actually could be seen to be a people who could win material goods who were, who were not, if you like, genetically, given to poverty. They seem to be in Ireland, but not uh, in the United States, and to some extent in the, the failed migrations to, the many failed migrations to the United Kingdom, where the Irish had not succeeded economically to anything like the degree that they were to do in a brief two generations in the United States. This says Brodell, and this says Newman, who wanted actually to found a Catholic university in Dublin, so that Catholic, English-speaking Irish Catholics could convert the empire, the English-speaking empire, to Roman Catholicism. That was his vision, and that was a vision for middle-class male Catholics uh, who, you know, who bred Irish tenors and Catholics in an equal, equal ratio, and who would spread all over the world, uh, singing versions of Thomas More or versions of Verdi, or whoever it might be, and in a sense, converting the world musically and converting the world to this new kind of faith. So that the beginning of the stereotype, the relationship between eloquence, which in fact, remember, is when it's spoken of in the context which, in which I, to which I've been referring, is always eloquence in the English language. In a language, you know, that globally can be understood. The relationship between eloquence and poverty is one that has to be broken for the sake of Irish development. But it's one also that the Irish revival and the free state government after the Irish revival clung on to right until the 1960s because it seemed to them to be part of the way in which Ireland as an idea of a different kind of civilization, a so-called spiritual civilization, could be retained. But of course, when it broke, it broke almost completely. And when it broke with it, was broken that binary between the spiritual and the material. But has there ever been a country which, you know, having had poverty and then achieved wealth or economic development of some kind or other, did not say that with that had disappeared, you know, all sorts of traditional practices, all sorts of traditional kindnesses and genealogies and communalities? Is it not said that you know, people, people become and they become subjective, atomized, selfish individuals who are economically privileged, lose all those communal virtues that went with poverty? I mean, this is one of the theme songs of modernity, isn't it? You'll find this in Ulysses and the Wasteland and the Cantos, just to mention English speaking or English written um, works that are classic to modernity. And modernity always has this nostalgia within it. And it's English, it's American, it's Irish, it's French, it's German forms. Always has this notion within it that somewhere just over the horizon there, there was an organic community which we once had. And somehow that idea of the organic community lost its legitimacy. And it lost its legitimacy when the idea of the backward place 
the place that was not, not developed, that could not be developed, why could it not be developed? Why could Ireland, next door to England, the most powerful empire the world had seen since the Romans, why could it not be developed? Very seas, not very wide. Uh, the export of English capital could, you know, touch Argentina, China, Tibet. Why couldn't it, it go past, get into Dublin, never mind go past it to the west? Angela Burke was speaking the other week at the Notre Dame conference of the, uh, the transformation of the West under the congested, uh, con congested district scheme. And she was talking about how, in effect, the West was modernized by road building, by railroad building and such. But it was modernized in such a way that if you read some of the authors like Porrick O'Connor who read about it, this was a form of modernization which they found destructive and which they wondered, was this, is this the only form of modernization that's possible? Does it mean this? And if this is modernization, if this is what they call economic development, perhaps we would have, not so much better, better off without it, but perhaps we would have been better, it would have been more resourceful of us to find another mode of economic development than this one, which is so expensive in relation to, to those systems of, of living that previously we had we had nourished, but there's nothing. I don't I don't know of any Irish language source in the 20th century where they talk about you know the wonderful the wonderful way in which the Irish used to speak. It's the very fact that the Irish did speak once in Irish, did write once in Irish, and no longer write in that language. This is the great puzzle. This is the great dumbness. So that, you know, Ireland is obviously a country that has a literature that is torn at its very heart by this problem of language and by this problem of the relationship of modernity to language and the relationship of poverty to language and the relationship of wealth to eloquence. How is this to be in any, in any satisfactory way understood? Well, what I'm trying to suggest is that the, the moment at which the shift begins for Ireland for the Ireland that exists now. The moment at which Ireland begins to reconsider the ways in which it has been stereotyped and the ways in which it has stereotyped itself is that moment when the Lusitania begins, there's those 22 minutes in which the Lusitania begins to go under the waves off County Cork. Because that's the moment at which the British Empire ceases, in effect, to be the dominant empire of the waves. That's the moment at which the inevitability of American intervention in the First World War becomes evident to everyone. And you know, it's not a matter of whether Churchill did or Woodrow Wilson did not this or that or the other. Germany and the United States were going to fight for world hegemony twice. That would be the first time. The second time would be the second, the second war. And in each case, Ireland was going to have this curious, kinked relationship to the to the United States and to Germany. And in each case, you know, the Blasket Islands or the Islanders, or the islands of Ireland, were going to be at one and the same time the places in Ireland which were most remote from the centres of power, Dublin, London, Paris. And yet, as was said in a Blasket Island memoir belonging to the 1890s, the Blasket Islanders knew more about what was going on in Massachusetts than they did in what was going on in Dublin. Because if you think, what, what is, there, is there another correlative to wealth arriving on the shores of an impoverished area? What's the most, what's the simplest and most pragmatic equivalent to that, apart from, you know, something catastrophic or melodramatic like this? Surely the simplest equivalent to this is the letter from the emigrant, the letter containing money. From the 1880s, the Blasket Islanders, all of whom, or almost all of whom, finish up in Springfield, Mass, and abandon the Irish language promptly thereafter. But they had been, they had not only news of, they had money from the new world arriving on their doorsteps. And it was the only way in which, in fact, the economy survived. Nowadays, the Irish government, rather belatedly, but at least, you know, uh, with some degree, of uh, conscience is now wondering how much money it should give to help the broken down remnants of the Irish immigrants who went to the UK in the 40s and the 50s. 
and who worked on building sites without, uh, without any, any union rights, without any, any pro workers protection. And the remnants of him now exist in old people's homes, usually as alcoholic wrecks, uh, cut off from their families whom they supported during the worst years of Irish emigration. But their letters, their money home, was again a reminder of modernity, and a reminder of modernity as a system that dislocates people in order to make those people economically viable. And yet at the same time, the free state, which was such an economic failure, which actually was a system which, although you know, there are many, many things to be said in its favor, but it was an economic failure, and it was not only an economic failure, it was a state for which economic failure was a necessary precondition of success. It had to fail economically in order to be Irish in the way it wanted Irish to be. And it did. It did fail economically. It, it exported most of its young. It managed to have a GDP rate that is astonishing in relation to most other European countries. And yet, precisely because it did that, many people, even to this day, say it managed to retain its identity in a way that Belgium didn't, in a way that you know, uh, Italy didn't, whatever. I'm not going to delay much longer with this, but I remember, you know, speaking of Italy, I have a child who lives in Italy now, has lived there for a long time, and I was part of my, such as my musical upbringing was, which was pretty emaciated, but um, the major form of music I knew as a kid growing up wasn't Irish folk songs, it was Italian opera and especially Verdi's opera. And, you know, I've sometimes wondered why, say, in the North, among the minority population, there were two kinds of song that we knew best. Tom Moore and The Nation, standard stuff. You know, Believe Me If All Those Endearing Young Charms, or A Nation Once Again, that sort of stuff. But the other music we knew, though we didn't understand the words, but that was fine for Irish people, you know, they're always using words they don't understand, especially <laughs> Irish words. But the other, the other music we knew was the music of Verdi and the great arias from Verdi, which we scarcely knew then had become, like for instance, you know, the song of the Hebrew slaves in Nabucco, which was practically the Italian national anthem. And we used to, in Patrick's day, uh, you know, when, when facing the police, because we had the nerve to walk, we used to link arms and sing the Hebrew, in a la di da fashion, sing the Hebrew song before the police Police charge, in which case, you know, it would become the usual raucous sort of riot. But we didn't even know then we were singing what had become an Italian national anthem. It's as if, at a level below the conscious, we knew that there was a way in which the Italians had managed. There was a way in which the Italians had managed, you know, through their musicians, through their opera, through the great idea of the aria, which is both the single, the great single voice of subjectivity and is also the great voice of the, com the communality of the nation. We used to think we've nothing like that, but of course we had that. But we didn't have it in music. Or we had it only in those versions of, of Tommy Moore's or Thomas Davis's music, which we always took with a grain of salt. No, we had it in literature. We had it in Stephen Daedalus. We had it in Christy Mahon. We had it even at times in Yeats. Sometimes great literature, sometimes third-rate literature. We had it, although we didn't, of course, took us a long time. I still don't think we, we quite recognized. We also have it in someone like uh, Samuel Beckett. I mean, think, just think, and this is, this is the final reflection I'll inflict upon you. Think of Beckett's work in relation to the idea of poverty. Think of how bedraggled and poor the people in Beckett are, and think of how inescapably they are bound up with language, whether it's in French or in English. And even there in French and English, he makes, he makes the point that English is too rich. French has the chasteness, French has the, the clarity, the lucidity that English does not provide. But think of, you know, you know the old Hugh Kenner notion of the Beckett hero, which I don't entirely agree with. but. It's useful to my purpose here, so I use it. The notion that the Beckett hero is like someone who is, has been, as Beckett was, a member of the French resistance in the Second War. 
And uh, let's imagine that he belongs to a cell. And as we know, uh, a secret organization should be cellular if it's to survive. So that you know there is somebody above you, but you don't know who it is. Because when you're taken in for interrogation, you know, so terrifying is the interrogation that you're going to tell anything, anything you can think of. So a Beckett character who is talking and talking and talking endlessly is like somebody who's under, under the torture. And he knows there is somebody above him. And the torturers, in this case, the Germans, know everybody who's below him. They're climbing up the ladder for the next rung in the ladder. And as they put him to the torture, he wants to tell. But he can't tell. He can't say who it is. He doesn't have the language for that which is above him. So all he can do is use the language for that which is on the same level with or below him. And it's futile. It's useless. It's what we already know. So Beckett's work is full of all these inventories, all of these moments where you know you go through these these brilliant maneuverings, you know the end game in chess, uh, the famous pebble sucking sequence, uh, where you know how many many mathematically in many ways are there to suck 36 pebbles in succession, making sure that you suck no pebble more than more than once. You know you want to say this is madness, but of course this is. This is, uh, this is a madness that has a logic in it. This is the logic of saying that language cannot provide us with a truth which we nevertheless know to exist. We know what's there. We know there's somebody above us. We know there's somebody from whom the order came. And to save our lives, we would give the name, but we can't give the name. So he will always be the unnameable. And in some ways, you know, when Beckett's people are reduced to those, those tramps that we see in Waiting for Godot, uh, those wrecks that we see in the trilogy, you know, they're very like, aren't they, Singh's tramps. They're very like all of those people whose nakedness, whose physical nakedness is actually an indication of their eloquent powers. But in Beckett, of course, for the first time, I think, in Irish writing, for the first time, eloquence is shown to be useless. It doesn't work. It doesn't apprehend the world. All it does is inventory those aspects of the world which we already know. Tell us something we don't know, uh, the torturers are asking. And the, the man is trying to, trying to produce, the, produce the answer to that and, of course, can't do it. So in this, in this sense, what, what I'm, what I'm um, suggesting to you is that when we look at endurance crushed by the ice in 1916, when we look at the Titanic going under to the iceberg in 1912, or when we look at the Lusitania going under the waves in 1915, we are actually looking at three moments at which, in very different ways, and I'm pretty glad to hear I'm not going to tell you about the other two now, but in, in very different ways, we are looking at the beginning of modernity and the end of an old civilization. And with the end of an old civilization comes the end of the stereotypes that help to sustain it. And so the most valuable thing to me is not whether there's a Rembrandt or a Titian under the waves, or whether Mr. Gregory Beams of Texas is able to haul them up, or whether, as he believes, if he ever gets the license to inspect the room, he will haul up the munitions that prove you know, that the old propaganda effort over the Lusitania was misplaced. In some ways, there could hardly be anything of less interest now. At the same time, we know that when the Blasket Islanders saw that the ruins of that ship, and even that unfortunate able-bodied seaman from the east of London, his gold-picked body arriving on their shores, in some sense they knew not that, not that uh, heaven had come, but that a new world had been born. And the new world that Isaiah Bowman spoke of, it was a new American world and the survival of which, and the existence with which, uh, Ireland happily joined, and now joined in an, under a different set of stereotypes. Not entirely different, but a different set of stereotypes than that which had existed, it had existed under the British Empire. And the central stereotype was broken, was the stereotype between the essential connection between the Irish capacity to speak and the Irish capacity to be poor. Now the Irish could manage not to be poor, 
and still to be able to speak, they had in fact, as Bowman had suggested, they had in fact joined the American economic global system. And uh, for the first time, we could, I say, that maybe the Lusitania was the first foreign direct investment in Ireland of that system. <laughs> Finally, it brought, began to bring Ireland out of the stereotypes in which it, it existed and changed the Irish world as well as changed the European world at that same moment. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. <clears throat> Black yeah. Irish, yeah. yeah. We're all from yeah. Connemara. We're with Insula, Los Common Mayo, yeah. you know, IRA, yeah. original IRA. Everyone spoke a different way. My grandfather read the Irish paper. But my question was, Seamus Haney spoke here. We talked about Kavanaugh mm -hmm. and the, um, his statement that will live for a thousand years. I am the monarch of all I survey. Um, my question is this, it has to do, we lost the language, but the music, it seems, the musicality that Haney and Kavanaugh um, show is, is born from that language. One interesting thing I read about the Irish language, the average English, most languages have X number of sounds in uh, something like 42 separate sounds, and the Irish is 62 separate sounds, so it's a black figure, but it was a, a uh, verbal, highly, uh, and I think it, it did something with the English that, that made it better, improved it, or at least made it somewhat Irish. It made it different, but, yeah. Is that a question, sort of, I mean, what's your thoughts on that, maybe? Yeah, but I don't have the, I don't have the knowledge to answer it properly. Um, I think it's true, I think it's true that there is a kind of, I mean, it's, it's almost a cliché, to say that the Irish language still exists in English as a kind of ghost. I think it's par partly true to say that there are, you know, there's Anglo-Irish, there's Hiberno-English, there's English, there's Irish-English, uh, that Heaney, as one of the, uh, uh, the examples you quote, <coughs> that Heaney does like to uh, exploit the fact that in Northern Irish speech, uh, in English, there are certain words that re are retained there that once used to be in English speech in the Elizabethan times, but which have disappeared from current speech in England and still remain in Ireland. So that, and you know, his favorite image of something being preserved, embalmed, as things in the bog or as something in amber, and how that act of preservation is an act of what? He didn't even think of it as an act of piety, uh, as an act of the writing of poetry for him is always an act of recovery, an act of retrieval, as well as an act of discovery. Discovery and recovery are hardly distinct in his work. And so his work, yeah, you're, I think you're right in this, that his work moves quite heavily. You know, the language is heavy. You know, it's, it's um, molasses poured over some kind of a frame, you know. It's, it's so, at times, you know, the, the the heavy strokes in a Heaney poem, you know, are like drum strokes. I'm thinking of poems like Sandstone Keepsake or The Wonderful Harvest Bow, poems like that, where, in effect, after a while, the stone or the, the, the straw bow at the center of the poem begins to, it's, it almost becomes magnetic. It begins to accrete to itself so many meanings that you think, you know, this poem is in severe danger of becoming a black hole. Everything is going to disappear. <laughs> but he just holds it long enough for it to be that heavy. Now, I think it's true that there are not many literary traditions in the English language that can uh, lend or from which such a weight can be inherited. 
I mean, you've only to think of the English poets from whom Heaney learned, like Hopkins, who tried to do that for English, and in some ways magnificently succeeded in it, or I suppose among contemporary writers, Geoffrey Hill would be one who exploits the resources of English in order to try and get that weight. But I think it's certainly true that in Ireland there, is, there has to be always a kind of consciousness of the weight of language because of language is something discovered and lost at the same time because of the Irish language and as you say that kind of musicality. Though how one would you know, measure it, it's almost impossible to say. But you can, you can hear it. It's like saying, you know, what's the difference between Austrian opera and Italian opera? You know, the Italian opera is usually, usually, at least in the 19th century, politically much more charged than Austrian. Or even, to put it, put it even worse, I think it's possible, I was saying this, I was going to say something like this at the lunchtime seminar today, it might be possible if you read say, Joyce is against Proust, to say that in the language of one, and, and neither one could, you know, could be accused of exactly being languid in language, but the weight in Proust is the weight of a controlling force. The weight in Joyce is the weight of a force that has been mutilated, maimed, and yet out of that mutilation is actually generating another kind of possibility. Joyce is always asking the question, say in Ulysses, what if Caesar had not been killed? You know, that, that <coughs> lodged in the room of the infinite possibilities and the place of, of the infinite possibilities that they displaced. He's talking about in the second episode of Ulysses. You know, the, the possibility of another modernity, the possibility of another kind of development than that which we have. You'll find that constantly in colonial literature or literature of place, places that have been colonized. In imperial places, the literature tends to ratify or sanction that which happened as the best of all possible works. And even when the, the figure in person is lying in bed, as he so often is, and um, imagining the world around him from the stars down to that little point of light where his candle is shining, the whole universe is French. The whole universe is Proustian. You know, there's no comparable moment in Irish writing. I don't think there can be. There's no, no possibility of that kind of concentricity being achieved. It's always making a virtue of being, you know, adventurous, risked, <coughs> peripheral, and yet at the same time opening possibilities that never were, never were historically actualized. Richard? Seamus. Richard, I'm talking of coincidences. Just last week there was a talk by Derek Cross passed away in Macmillan on, on a ghost ship, um, which was the, the, the light ship, you, you may remember, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was um, anchored off the Grand Rock. So sure today, yeah. Was the day the, the, the Grand Rock, but other than some I think maybe it did go down the Grand Rock. And she was talking about how this ship, which she then rehabilitated, had been put out of usage, and so on, when the light ships you know, were removed and they modes of warning, 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 warning. Um, it, She rehabilitated it and sent it around the different harbors in Ireland. And you may have seen it when it was in Dublin. Or but it, it, the exhibition is called Gone. And it's the theme, it's kind of the main motif or theme. And it strikes me that that sort of resurrection in contemporary and visual Irish art of the ghost ship, mm. which is itself sort of a ghost of of the Lusitania, is, is like something coming up from the unconscious, um, particularly as Dorothy describes it. And what you're talking about this evening as an event in our history, and our literary history, where the ship comes, the ship sinks and the ship comes ashore, uh, to me is very kind of exciting because it's, it's not something that I'm terribly familiar with in modern or contemporary Irish literature as such. I mean, I think of, mm -hmm. as you were talking, I was thinking, well, where in, where in Beckett do we see ships? Or you know, where in Cabinet do we see ships? Where in Joyce? And apart from maybe 
one or two thoughts that Stephen Dennis has had about the wreck of the Armada and he's walking along. Yeah. Is it uh, Sunny and Strand? But there almost seems to be an absence of the ship, which is a curious thing coming from an insular culture that, you know, many centuries ago through the Imrab would have a huge kind of literature around uh, the notion of, of circumnavigatio and shipping and, say, Brendan and whatnot. And I'm just wondering if, if you have any thoughts on why such an important event as this ship sinking and coming ashore, uh, while it's coming up now maybe in, in Irish visual art, should not have really surfaced in terms of shipping news during the course of about 100 years of, of Irish literature, where it seems to be almost conspicuously absent, mm. Joyce Beckett, Cavanagh, and, and others. Well, That's I just, just a hunch. You know? Yeah, just uh, bounce off the wall reason would be that one of the reasons was that the, um, the reaction against the revival in the 1930s through to the 1960s and the development of various forms of realism as opposed to, you know, what was called romanticization of the revival period was so pronounced in Ireland that I think almost everything having to do with the islands, the coastal, you know, the mirage of the West, if you like, the ghost ship, uh, that was repudiated for, you know, a sort of Flann O'Brien, Patrick Kavanagh, even up to John Ban Banville kind of realism, you know. And, uh, but I think realism is, is a much more difficult concept than is, is generally understood. But uh, the, the notion would be, the notion behind it is that we live in the secular, we live in the here and now, we live in the actual, and not in that realm of the imaginative and the ghostly, and in the realm of the repressed, which after, I mean, if you say to me, where are the ghosts of Irish literature? I'd say they're all in the 19th, and the best ones are in the 19th century, before the Lusitania sank. Um, Dracula had been the best of them, and the most telling of them. Which is, and he is a sort of a return of the repressed, you know. And it's, it's, again, it's the classic formulation, which we do owe, I suppose, to Freud. The classic formulation that something that is repressed for long enough, when it returns, it returns as something demonic, as something vengeful, destructive. And that's the kind of imagery that dominates much English language literature in Ireland from, I'd say, from the period of the end of the famine, the 1850s, to the, the brink of the Second War. After that, it's much harder to speak of it, you know. But I think the Again, I was trying to say something like this at the, the, the lunchtime discussion today. You know, if you think of the variety <coughs> of forms of realism that we have in Irish writing, it's not the same. It's not at all the same as English or French realism. I mean, take, take our great um, canonized saint of realism, Joyce. Is one of the, the features about reading Joyce the fact that, I know, just think of the short stories, Dubliners. Uh, when you're reading Dubliners, you think, ah, oh, I can just see the allegory there. You know, that's an allegory, a religious allegory of Easter and Holy Communion and Good Friday, and, and then it just disappears. It's like, you know, the ghost has been brought into modern circumstances, has been brought into electric light. I just can't make it into that world. It's like looking at uh, the way Joyce talk, writes about windows up until the dead. All the windows face onto a blank, you know, a blank wall. There's no, there's no prospect until the, the end of the dead. And then well, what does it face into? Not just the snowflakes, but maybe the dead, the spirits of the dead. This is a Galway, which is, you know, the West, there is a place which is maybe a seductive and at the same time phantasmal place of the imagination. And maybe, maybe it is the reality that is there to rebuke the middle class life of Dublin. But you know, realism like that isn't secular. Realism like that has all the apparatus of the secular, of the here and now. Again, I was saying it last time today, if you think of the way in which we now read Dutch paintings, you know, the Dutch interior as opposed to Italian religious paintings, it's the same sort of thing where you say, look, that's a world, that's a Dutch empire. The great 
Republican experiment by the Dutch produced paintings which are so much of this world and are so much, so much given to those beautiful, luxuriant surfaces of the wealthy, you know, brass and mirror and lace and silk and letter writing and ink and shadow and sunlight and windows. And yet, you know, as people have begun to do now, looking at them again and saying, but this isn't realism. This is allegory. This is ancient allegory repainted. You know, you think of all those things I just mentioned, how frequently they're found in allegories. And they're allegories of the spiritual life or of the fact that people who live in such splendid, uh, embedded in such splendid possessions are people whom the painters are saying to us, have, they have lost. They have lost contact with the spiritual. They have lost contact with the more important things. So that every, every little curlicue of the list reminds us of the fact that these people are lost to the material. You know, the, and Irish realism has a strong element of that. But it's a strong element of that which I'd say from 30, 1930 to 1950, from early Beckett to um, later 1950, say to Michael Farrell, you know, the novel that tears might cease, something like that, where the, where the secular, where the realistic was saying, we rebuke and refuse the tradition that was full of these allegorical or symbolic or religious or spiritual dimensions. We're now, we're now in the here and the now, and the here and the now is squalid and it's grubby, but at least it's not given to that kind of you know, exaggeration, for which the only correlative and the is the ghost. You know, the ghost that haunts the room is the history that has not been, that has not been dealt with. Um, I'd say, so, yes, you're right that in painting, this, is, this has come back more. This has returned more than it ever did in, in literature. Is there time for one more? Yeah, just, just a point of information. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm just trying to think about ships in Irish poetry. There's McNeese, where the ship is a prison ship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's Roy McFadden, who has the, uh, another ship that goes down between Scotland and the North Coast. And of course, there's Matthew, who's got the Titanic poems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there yeah, is, there, is. There, are, there, are, there, are, there are some there. Yeah. And there's also a talk about recent disasters. There's the Air India disaster yeah. off the Irish coast. When you know all those people were brought down by the bomb on board. Yes. And was it just last last month that the person accused of it was was released for lack of evidence in Canada? And that was a I mean, re reading the accounts of that and then reading the earlier accounts of the bringing to shore of some of the, you know, something like 700 people were buried near Cork, victims of the Lusitania. And reading the accounts of each disaster, you know, there's a strange similarity in the people saying, you know, they could not, they could not actually believe the scale of what they were looking at. They couldn't believe the suddenness with which this had happened. Because, of course, along with the wealth that came in sh on the, onto the shores of the Blaskets, where the corpses that came in the shores of the county court. What happened to the material itself? I mean, the, is it on a basket iron still? Is it, has it been housed anywhere? Or is there any... No, they used it. They used it, ate it, consumed it, made it into boats or whatever, you know? But no, there's, as far as I know, there's no, so there's no remnant. Know, there's no, no materials left in Ireland or I think the only materials left is in the ship itself. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you.